Hello, hello all the nerds out there. Today it is our last class on Greek theater, and especially in Greek comedy, right? And today we are going to discuss Menander and his new comedy, especially Daskolas that we are going to discuss. So anyway, let's start right away. So first of all, I would like to tell something about Menander. So Menander was born somewhere between three uh, forty-two, and his full life span. Uh, goes to 292 BC. So as we have, as we know, we are discussing Athenian dramatist, right? So he was Athenian dramatist whom ancient critic considered the supreme poet of new comedy, of Greek new comedy. So he is actually the last uh, dramatist in the stage of comedy. So he wrote more than hundred plays and he won only eight victories at Athenian. You know, dramatic festival. Let's move on to life and work of Menander. So Menander was kind of top at that time. This dude was like you know way back, and he was very famous playwright in ancient Greeks, and they called him the top dog of Greek new comedy. So which was the last kind of you know funny play is Athens also. So back in the day, uh, his plays didn't make him. A mega star, even though he churned out over hundred of them, he only managed to snag eight wins at the big drama festival Dionysia, right? And by the time Menander came along, comedy had shifted his focus from politics to everyday life. The chorus, those singing and dancing folks, you remember from the previous uh, sessions, took a back seat and only popped up between acts. So the actors. Still wore mask, and uh, but they got fancier to match the wide range of character you'd find in comedy about manners. So it made it easier for the audience who didn't have playbills to know who was who and who. So this confusion was there. So Menander was a master at portraying character like strict dads, young lovers, gold digging ladies, scheming slaves, and many more. So he was one of the most popular writers in antiquity, but his work was lost during the Middle Ages, and is now known in highly fragmented, fragmented pieces, so fragmentary form, much of which was discovered in twentieth century. Only one play, which is Dias Colos, Colos, has survived almost completely. So we are only going to discuss uh, this play. So this play. Really showed off his skill at light-hearted comedy. So there's this uh, grumpy dude named Kenaman in the in this comedy, who is a total misanthropy. It's kind of very hilarious, and Menander was also a kind of you know champ at creating classes and contrast between characters and their moral principles. Again, his plays like uh, Perikeromeni and Second Adelphi are. Prime example, there is, you know, crowning achievement. Again, the Roman and Plot, you know, the Romans like Plato's and Terence loved Menander's work so much that they adapted a bunch of it. His influence spread like wildfire through European comedy from the Renaissance onward. So those Roman adaptation are like kind of missing puzzle. That give us a glimpse into Menander's lost play. Sad, sadly, we don't have a complete collection of his work, except that Dioscolos, which was first printed in 1958 from some ancient, you know, papyrus leaves found in Egypt. So anyway, it was. Uh, we have only one play to talk about today. So we don't know much about, uh, in fact, Menander's life. But the, you know, what we have is from the. Other sources. So he was supposed, you know, it seems like he was very rich and wealthy, and he came from a fancy family. And rumor has it that he studied under Theophrastus, Phrastus, uh, who is a philosopher for, you know, after uh, Aristotle. So in who followed Aristotle actually. So in 321 BC, Menander debuted his first play called Anger. He scored a prize. Uh, of course, in 316 with Dioscolus, and finally won big at the Dionysia festival next year. So by 301 BC, 
uh, Menendo had written over 70 plays. He probably hung out in Athens for most of his life and turned down offers to go Macedonia and Egypt. So apparently what he did, he met his end by drowning while swimming at the port of Athens called uh, Piraeus. What a way to go, right? So Menendo once said, he who labors diligently need never despair for all things are accomplished by diligence and labor. So that was a quote that Menenda said. So now let's move to our uh, play here, which is Discolus, you can say, or Discolus. So Discolus, which was published in 316 BC, right? So we'll just talk about all, we'll just move with the context here. So in the context, so this display, Discolus, also known as the grouch or misanthropy. So we'll just move to this word, uh, the misanthropy, which was also, uh, you know, title of French playwright named Moliere. So you must have heard about this work. Anyway, so it's the only play by Menander which is survived and it won Menander a top prize when it was first published in Athens way back in 316 BC. So for a long time, we only had like bits and pieces of this play, like some quotes and, uh, you know, there. But in 1952, they found this old manuscript in Egypt. What a surprise, right? So dating back to the third century that had almost the whole thing. So it's called the Bodmer Pap Papri uh, and uh, Oxyrinchus Papri. So you don't have to pay attention for that uh, because of that we had finally got to read the whole play when it was published in 1958 by this no, you know, this guy called Victor Martin. So the story is about uh, one rich young guy named uh, Sostratos. He falls head over heels for this girl from a small village. And the problem was this girl's dad, no, whose name was Nimon, is one grumpy old man. So he's hard to approach and always in a bad mood. But uh, Sostratos, what he did, he doesn't give up and he ends up helping, you know, you know Nimon's stepson, whose name is Gorgias, rescue the old man from a well. So this act of heroism wins uh, Nimon's heart and he agrees to let as Sostratos marry his daughter and get this Sostratos even manages to convince his own dad to let him arrange a mar you know arrange marriage between his sister and Gorgias so now here's the cool part this play which is uh, you can call misanthropy also and this colas uh, is actually inspired up our French playwright Moliere and he knew that the basic idea of the play because they hadn't found the whole thing yet but it is still influenced him when he wrote his play the misanthropy in 1666 right so it is all about the context here now we'll move to the characters and as you can see here in the screen there are these major characters that will appear in the play so anyway these characters starts with pan this character of Kyrieus. i don't know how to say anyway he is the slave of socrates another is who is our main character is Sostratos, son of wealthy Athenian. Again, we have the Phraias, who is a slave of Sostratos, Sostratos townhouse Neman, who is also called the Grouch, right? So then again, another character, Marianne, is there, who is the daughter of Neman, and Daos, who was the slave of uh, Gorgias. And Gorgias is Neman's stepson. And then Sikon, a hired cock. Then we have Getas, slave in Sostratos. Sostratos, Sostratos country house and Simish, another slave of Nemon. And eventually we have two characters, Kilipedes, who is the father of Sostratos and of course mother of Sostratos, another character. So this is all about the character. Now we'll move to the plot immediately. So what happened actually in the beginning, we meet a, you know, name called Pan. So it's actually the prologue of the uh, display this comedy so in the prologue what happened in the beginning of uh, this prologue we meet name you know pan and who is the god of the woods who tells us about the neighboring form farm and uh, this neiman another character is kind of grumpy guy who lives with his daughter maria and their servant smichi so on the other so on the other side Gorgias works with a slave called Deos and Neiman's wife has taken refugee there. So next what happened this guy 
Sostratos. Sostratos is kind of, you know, wealthy and rich Athenian, falls in love uh, with uh, Naaman's daughter named Marianne, and thanks to Pan's trick. And he sends his slave, Faraya, to talk to her father, but Faraya comes returning back with the, you know, message and also chased by a madman. So, 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 so Sostratos decides to wait for, you know, Naaman himself and ask his poor companion, uh, Kairis, to come back the next day. So, uh, that Uh, Neiman. Neiman again appears with his uh, grumbling about trespasser and Sostratos tries to talk to him but Neiman, Neiman is unfriendly and goes inside. So Sostratos decides to seek help from his father's clever slave Gitas. So that Gitas, uh, meanwhile Mariana comes out and gets water from the nymphs since their water pot broke. So Sostratos offers to help her and goes with to, to the temple and now what happens this Dios who is uh, like Gorgias slave right sees Sostratos giving the jar to Mariana and assumes he had bad intention and he rushes to inform Gorgias her half brother so a group of drunk pan worshipper centers dancing and having fun and in act 2 what happens in act 2 that Gorgias returns from the field of Dios Sostraso, that Sostratos tells them he couldn't find Gaitas and explain, explains his love for Mariana. And Gorgias warns him that Nenam is a kind of uh, misanthropic and only wants a poor farmer for his daughter. Uh, what a fun anyway. So Dios asks him, uh, Sostratos, Two, you know, that she, he should work in the field to impress Neiman, lending him a home. And uh, Sostratos agrees and they go to the field. So the cook, Sikon, arrives, followed by Gaitas, carrying a load of uh, cushions, and they discuss a sacrifice that Sostratos' mother wants to make because of bad dream. Sikon promises Gaitas a good meal, they go to the temple together. And what happens in the Act 3 is quite surprising. So Nenam, Neiman plans to work in the field, but Sostrato's mother and her followers arrive for a sacrifice, irritating Neiman. Gaitas asks to borrow a cooking pot, but Neiman refuses. Sikon also asks, but Neiman again angrily, uh, angry, uh, angrily, he hates him. So he was kind of mad and he was angry and with that he hits with a strap and Sostrato the return returns from the field tired. So what happened? Gaitas complains about the work and Sostrato invites Gorgias and Dios to me, you know, the feast to win them over. And again, Naaman servant woman, another character, Smichi, laments dropping the water jar in the wall. In the well, actually, and Naaman angrily, you know, again chases her down. And Sostrato arrives with Georgias and Dios. Sostrato tells Naaman about the rescue from the well, and Naaman realizes his misanthropy and decides to change. So he adopts Georgias as his son and agrees. Sostrato's marrying Mariana, everything is fixing right. So Sostrato's father, Kelepides, again arrives and they discuss the wedding. In Act 5, Sostratos persuade his father to let, you know, uh, convince his father uh, and also persuade him to let Gorgias marry his sister. After some agitation, uh, Callipides agrees, promising dowries, and they decide to have the wedding the next day. So Smichi calls out Neiman, who is reluctant at first, but they help him join the party. So Gaitas and Sikon tease Naaman by pretending to borrow things and finally they carry Naaman into the temple. Everyone celebrates and looks forward to the wedding. So in a in, in very simple language, if you ask me, it's a very, you know, I can just brief it in one small para. So it will be like it is the story about one wealthy guy, Sostres, okay, and he falls for you know, head over heels for this girl, Mariana from a small village. But problem was that the girl's dad, Neiman, is, you know, grumpy old man and he only wants her daughter to marry a farmer. And he's hard to approach and always in bad mood. 
so Sustratos doesn't give up. He ends up helping Naemon's stepson, Gorgias, rescue the, this man from a well. So that act of heroism wins Naemon hearts and they eventually agreed to let Sustratos marry his daughter and get this. So Stratos even manages to convince his own dad to let him arrange a marriage between his sister and Gorgias. So quite a simple plot, but if you put so many characters into the small uh, summary, it will be difficult. So at the end, what we always do, we make it a brief so you will understand. So anyway, that was all about the plot. And now let's move to the analysis. So as we know, this play uh, is, you know, falls under the new comedy, in which was uh you know started by menander right so during menander's time aristophanes old comedy was like famous at that time and it also had given way to new comedy this happened after ethan's lots you know lost its political independence and importance due to defeat by uh you know philip ii of M macedon and the death of Alexander the Great. So freedom of speech was no longer a thing and a state-sponsored dramatic festival were a thing of the past. So the audience consisted mostly of educated and leisurely people. So what happened in new comedy? The prologue became more important. So it was usually spoken by a character or a divine figure and set the stage for the play. So often giving away the happy ending and reducing suspense. So comedies had five act on and with irrelevant interlude performed by chorus dialogues was spoken in everyday language there and the play had universal themes and realistic plot with a reference to specific athenian or revens so new comedy relied on stock character especially representing uh, social types like the strict father kind old man reckless son country bumpkin bully parasite courts you know courtsman mask were also used with this distinct feature not individualized one so characters just like average athenians and exaggerated props like phalluses were no longer used so colors were associated with the specific character type and the cast list in the new comedy were long and actors played multiple sort short roles in one play with quick costume changes so the character of neiman who was as we know as myth misanthropic and grumpy luna represent a whole class in new comedy so menander believed that neiman's disposition shaped him not just his circumstances even though neiman realized by the end of the play that people need each other he doesn't change his nature and remains unpleasant and Anti-social. So Menander stands out for portraying a variety of individualized and sympathetic slaves. He didn't see them as mere fool, you know, tools or for comic relief. He treated slaves as human, brings worthy of attention, just like free individuals. So slaves in the play had their own motivation with the framework set by their owners, actions, and intention. They didn't direct events but had an impact on them. So that was all about new comedy menendus new comedy and with that we are ending our greek theater where we have discussed tragedies and old comedies and also new comedy so everything we have covered here and i hope this week we have now understood the greek theater so next we are starting miracle mystery and morality play and after that, we'll just straight move to the Renaissance, where we'll talk about Webster, we talk about, you know, Middleton and so many more. So stay tuned. And of course, uh, if you haven't subscribed the channel, you do it now. And of course, enroll if you can, because everything will be there and we're going to cover A to Z. We are not going to leave a single thing. So this exam, you're going to get your GRF in the highest mark. Trust me. So anyway, that's all for today. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye and have a great day.